Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, the second of three of our panel discussions with the folks from um, NBC Universal News Group. Uh, this is going to be session two on how news organizations ensure fair representation on air. Um, I know this is actually a topic I've been wanting us to address for, for a long time. I think a lot of us kind of have just a lot of questions about how that happens. Like, how do we decide who's going to be on camera? Uh, just a couple of just six things. Um, we are recording, uh, so we'll share that. If you have gen general comments, please add those in the chat. If you have a question you'd like to pose to the panelists or anyone who is talking, uh, please use the Q&A function uh, to be able to do that. So. Um, I'm John Silver from the News Literacy Project. We are very, very thankful that you are taking time out of your day uh, to learn with us today. And I'm going to hand off to uh, Jesse Rodriguez. He is the Vice President of Booking and Editorial at, MS at MSNBC. Um, and I'm going to let him take over from here. And uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing from, from everyone and, and learning some very cool stuff about your work. Awesome. Well, thank you, John. Really appreciate you and your team um, for um, helping uh, put this together. And of course, um, our friends um, from around the country and around the world who are joining us um, here on the other side. I'm Jesse Rodriguez. I'm the Vice President of Booking and Editorial for MSNBC. Welcome to this NBCU Academy panel on how news organizations ensure fair representation on air. Um, NBCU Academy is a free online journalism and media training program reaching 45 colleges and universities nationwide, including 15 new partner schools that we just announced yesterday. Students and young media professionals everywhere can go to NBCUacademy.com for all kinds of training videos and articles on best practices. There's even a brand new Fundamentals of Journalism course you can tell your students all about. All right, so today in this conversation, we want to reveal how and why we choose people to appear on our air, our shows, as well as the effort we make to present diverse viewpoints, experts, and guests during live news coverage, whether it's on CNBC, MSNBC, or NBC News Now. We'll also likely use the term booking or booked. That means that scheduling someone to come on one of our shows. If you have questions for us, again, as John mentioned, please drop them in the chat. All right, so let's um, introduce you to our panelists. I believe Andre Brooks has joined us. There he is. Hello, Andre. Andre is an executive producer at NBC News Now, which is our streaming service for NBC News. Bill Henkel is a coordinating booking producer also with NBC News Now for all of the shows that air on that streaming service. Lori Ann LaRocco, a CNBC News Senior Editor of Guests and also an accomplished author. Marcy Santiago, booking producer for MSNBC's Deadline White House with Nicole Wallace, which airs weekdays from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. And Nina Sen, who is the Director of News Standards here, focusing on race, class, and gender at NBC News and for the NBC Universal News Group. So thank you all for joining us today. We are really excited um, to be able to bring this uh, discussion to you. And I want to kick things off with a question. I'll start with Marcy. Um, Marcy, you book for a show, Deadline White House, which is a panel show. It's two hours, as I mentioned. How do you and your show producers determine who to book so there is a fair representation of views? Yes, thank you for the question, Jesse. Um, you know, we, it's by news story, but always top of mind is who best represents the country, who best represents this story, who can tell it with the most accuracy, with the most credibility. So, um, you know, to give you some examples, you must have someone from the community. If we're talking about the death of a black man at the hands of police, we're talking about getting a police officer, we're talking about getting an African-American person on to discuss how that affects their community. If you're talking about a shooting at a Lunar New Year uh, you know, event, we're talking about getting Asian-Americans from that community. If we're talking about reproductive healthcare, we're talking about doctors, we're talking about women. You always want to have, you know, someone who can speak as closely to that story as possible. And not only are we talking about gender, racial diversity, we're talking about geographic diversity. We need people from the middle of the country as well as the East Coast and the West Coast. We need um, journalists whose job is to give the facts. 
we need subject matter experts who aren't involved directly with the story, but have experiences and they can give their best educated opinion on what's happening. So basically we look at what this story requires and we think to ourselves, who can tell this story for us? How can we be credible about this, you know, while also, you know, keeping those journalistic uh, integrity intact? That's certainly very important at NBC News and, and, and all of our um, platforms, um, keeping our journalistic integrity intact, keeping the name of NBC News um, really is something that we think about every day uh, when we put together our, our broadcast. I think I have a graphic um, to show you of something that got a lot of attention at the time. And this is important um, for us as an example, because we certainly never want to be in a position where we have um, not <laughs> they're not the right representation for the story that we want to cover. And here are a couple of examples. On the right, you see the Fox News interview. They've got three men, three white men, talking about the overturning of Roe v. Wade, an issue um, that involves abortion and women. Um, no representation from the people actually impacted by this. Um, and that is a big problem um, in, in that case. On the left, you see an issue where they're interviewing three men um, when they're referring to Hillary Clinton, who, who was the first female presidential nominee for the Democratic Party at the time. That was um, a concern for a lot of folks because they, um, they were ma making a, a point on, in that specific interview about her being a female and there was no female representation. So those are two examples of why we take representation so seriously, so importantly, and we can, um, we can take that down now um, here. So the next question I wanna go to um, is to Lori Ann Larocco. You've worked for many years to bring diversity to CNBC's shows, and it was challenging for a while because CNBC covers a business industry that's dominated by white males. How have you gone about to break those barriers to find the diverse voices from across the spectrum and not just diversity in gender, but also diversity in uh, geography? Most of you know the Wall Street bankers are based in New York, but you, you've been able to find folks all over the country, all over the world. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, you know, that, it's a great question. I, I'm, a, I'm a big reader. And so I'm constantly combing through websites from around the world. And I also want to think about who do I want to see, you know, talking about, say, um, an appointment for the Hispanic community or the Black community. I am going to get an economist that represents that population. And so what I do is I'll start looking at, for example, we now have wonderful female Hispanic economists, and they're really, it's a very underrepresented form, you know, that, that aspect. And so I called the American Society of Hispanic Economists to see who was out there. And so what I do is that I, I, I pick up the phone, I do my research, pick up the phone, and then I get on the phone with them. Because anybody that's in, in this talk will attest you're listening for that soundbite. You want to know if somebody can be concise in their answers and be able to explain it, especially with what we do, in a non-wonky way. And it's hard enough to do it in 10 to 15 seconds in regular speak, but imagine if you're talking about the economy, throwing out data points and things like that. And so that's the way that I've approached it. And then I've also looked at the representation even across uh, gender, but also disability. You know, I had um, a deaf CEO on CNBC. She was interviewed with her ASL interpreter. And so we're trying to make this more mainstream. We all matter. And so anytime when we're looking at adding voices, we're very keen as to the balance of the discussion um, and more importantly, their relationship to, you know, to the topic at hand. Um, that is an amazing story um, of you being, being able to find someone and making it accessible for that person to share their point of view, um, regardless of their disability. It's not a disability. It's It turns out to be a, a boon for that person. Bill, I want to bring you into the conversation because you've worked for many different um, news organizations. Um, and over the years, you, you've been uh, doing this for, uh, for a little while. Um, what um, is the difference in the process of how different news organizations go out to look for diverse guests? How does, um, you know, how do the different places you've worked at, how do they take it um, and how do they deal with the, um, the process of finding someone that who's diverse, finding diverse guests? Sure. Um, thank you. It's a great question. And um, 
it's funny the one of the the uh, slides you just showed i worked for one of those companies and that actually was shown in one of our town halls saying basically don't do this um so but other than i've been pretty lucky that i think all the networks i've worked on they've been very inclusive they've been encouraging for us to to book and find um, diverse voices um you know, I think, like uh, Marcia and Lorianne said, um, it's a lot of, um, you know, doing your research, doing your due diligence. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of publicists. We get uh, pitches quite often. Um, we work with universities, think tanks, and you sort of research guests, look at their background, see what they've done, you know, talk to them, um, and really just gain appreciation for, you know, um, what they could bring to the conversation. Um, you know, we at News Now have been really lucky and they're encouraging this on a daily basis. We have um, recurring segments uh, on women in business. So it's all like female CEOs flipping the script, which is um, diverse voices from Hollywood and uh, the entertainment industry. So yeah, I've been really lucky that um, most all the companies I've worked for, especially NBC has been very encouraging to, to, to seek out those voices. And I'll add, we have um, a team that just focuses on um, highlighting those voices, and they're so good at letting us as booking producers know internally, hey, this is a good person for this story which just broke, or I've been in touch with um, community leaders in a specific community. Here are some contacts for you guys to reach out to as booking producers. It's just a collaborative effort at NBC News and at MSNBC to find diversity and find voices um, from diverse backgrounds when stories break and develop. Andre, I want to bring you in here because you've been an executive producer for several years, um, both at the network here at NBC News and also in local news. Um, in your role as an executive producer, an EP as we call it, you have the ultimate say in who appears on your program. What goes into your decision making um, and how do you keep a fair representation in mind as you're juggling all these various news stories, dealing with breaking news on a daily basis? Take us behind the curtain a little bit, Andre, and then I um, uh, go ahead. No, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, I think it's it's a lot of what everybody talked about, Bill, Marcy, Lorianne. It, it's really about just kind of taking the initiative and thinking about what the story is in the context of the story. One of my jobs as an executive producer is to not only make sure that we keep stories fair and balanced on both sides and that we're getting different voices, but making sure it's the right voices to speak to those particular topics. Um, I'll give you a real world example. Uh, this just happened two days ago. There was a story about African American uh, and African Americans and kidney disease. Um, we have great doctors on staff at NBC and MSNBC, Dr. John Torres, Dr. Natalie Azar. Um, but one of the things that I said to one of my bookers, and, and Bill knows this because he, he collaborates with a lot of my bookers, is I said, well, you know what? Why don't we reach out to Dr. Uche Blasak, who is an African-American um, doctor? So because it's just it's taking that extra step and saying, hey, you know what? Who's the best person to tell this story? Um, I think those slides tell it really, really well. I'll never forget when the um, Roe v. Wade decision came down. All of us and Jesse, I'm sure you were a part of this, were, you know, let's launch Pete Williams. Let's launch Ken Delaney and let's launch all these people. And we had all these great voices. And throughout the course of my coverage, I was just like, oh my gosh, I can't seem to get Julia Ainsley on air for whatever reason. I just, I can't seem to get her. And I, I kept making it a point to my team. I was like, line producers, we got to get Julia. Ask the desk. I know she's on MS. I know she's gathering. But you, you want to get at the end of the day, I'm sorry, you needed a female's voice to tell that story. You needed to hear from one. Pete Williams, a fantastic journalist. We all know that. Ken Delaney, a fantastic journalist. We all know that. But you've got to be thinking about who are the right people to tell those stories. So, you know, as an EP, that's what I'm thinking about. It's, it's not just how we're going to cover the story and how aggressively we're going to cover it, but who are the right voices that can help speak to those stories and give real life context to them. No, and going back to that image of those men talking about Roe v. Wade, it just to this day gives me a cringe feeling when I see that. And I say, gosh, I hope we never make that mistake here at NBC News. We have a question in the chat, in the, the Q&A box, and I want to encourage everyone to add your questions to the Q&A box. But I've got a question here from Melissa McGay, who asks that we, says we all represent, oh, the question is being answered. Um, but I want to bring it up um, here. Uh, 
you all seem to work for 24 hour news platforms, which we do. News coverage for us is a 24 seven affair. Um, and you cover the same stories. They have different panelists, but how can your shows showcase more of the stories that are important for the audience to understand? And I think um, that's a good question for Andre to answer as an executive producer. How do you decide, I guess, what goes into story decision-making um, and what stories you choose? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that we have a unique uh, kind of capability at NBC News now is we have much a lot more real estate than a lot of other platforms. We're not the Today Show to where you're on at seven o'clock and then you're off at nine o'clock or the third hour and you're off at, you know, 10 o'clock where, you know, MSNBC is, they have a great 24 hour platform, of course, but obviously we're targeting two different audiences there. We're also not nightly news to where you got to squeeze everything into 30 minutes. Um, we have the capability to say, hey, you know what, let's cover a broader range of stories. So constantly we're looking at stories that aren't necessarily being covered on MSNBC, that we are not seeing on NBC nightly news, that we are not seeing on the Today Show. Um, I, you know, that's why I like NBC news now is because it's kind of like saying, hey, let's take the best of the entire network. Um, I can't tell you how many ideas I get from my colleagues at CNBC um, are constantly pitching ideas. Diana Olick, one of the reporters there, just pitched a, emailed me and pitched a story idea just the other day. Um, you know, Bertha Coombs sent a pitch not too long ago. It's, it's really about collaborating with all of the resources and all of the entities and or uh, that are a part of your organization and saying, who's turning really good content. If it's a good story and if it's engaging and it's impactful and it's memorable and it's relevant, then that's the kind of story I'm gonna look at putting on. Now, at the end of the day, we, I wish we could cover every single story every day. We all have to make editorial decisions when we have to say, hey, you know what? Oh, that's just, I really like that story, but that's not gonna make the cut today. Um, it happens and it's, it's always gonna happen. It's a part of what we do. We're never gonna be able to cover every story that's out there. But I, I think I can speak for all of the different platforms and saying, we're all looking for those different types of stories, especially in this day and age to where content and absorption of that content and engaging in that content is just changing that people can get it from so many different places. They don't have to turn on news now. They don't have to turn on MS. So it's it's saying, what can we do to keep them engaged? What are the stories we're telling? Right, and you've done something um, with News Now where you basically reimagined the production style of, of a newscast to make it more accessible. And it has since been picked up and now that airs on the network, which um, is uh, is incredible. Um, and, uh, and and we certainly are all, are all proud of the work um, that NBC News Now is doing. I wanna bring in Nina. Nina, you um, have a role at, uh, at NBC News focusing on standards and practices. So it's not just involving the content we put on the air, but the weight that we give um, to, to put guests on the air. Where does um, your role uh, fit into the way we um, decide who we put on the air uh, and for what stories and when as, as head of standards um, and one of our leaders on, 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 on the standards that NBC News follows. Sure, um, thanks for having me. Um, the role with standards, it really has a bird's eye view of all the platforms, all our entire audience, our audience ranges from nightly news kids, 10 year old, all the way to, you know, people watching MS in the mornings, um, the Shea Show Network. So we're really looking at consistency and being able to provide something not show by show, but the entire network. What are we doing as a whole? Um, for guests on air, the things we really look at is not just who's saying, uh, not just what's being said, but who's saying it. Um, we're looking at diversifying who's saying what, uh, how many times do we see women scientists? How many times do we see a Native American person as a doctor, as a hospital, out of the settings that they're typically stereotypically placed in those boxes? Um, the other thing that's really important to standards in that regard is making sure that when something happens, we're not just going to politicians and experts. If there's a tornado in your town, are we talking to the mayor and a weatherman? Or are we talking to the people actually affected? If there's a shooting, are we ignoring people that um, can't speak English well and keep, you know, putting police officers and other experts on the line and not really talking to the people who live there? So that is what standards really looks at if we're using trans sources and stories about trans rights, those types of things. Let's talk a little bit about an example, um, and I've got a video that I wanted to play out here. This is um, 
when we go and decide why we put on folks for the reasons that we put them on for, this is going to take us back to last week when the um, speaker, or two weeks ago, I guess now, the, the speakership fight was playing out on Capitol Hill. And someone who in the past has said um, remarks that perhaps were not accurate um, or has lied um, in, in other interviews, this person was part of the group that was holding up the entire process. And we felt as a news organization at MSNBC that this was someone that was worth interviewing in this specific moment to find out why this person had so much power and was holding up the levers of government. Um, I'm talking about Representative Lauren Boebert, and she was interviewed by Stephanie Rule, who's the host of the 11th Hour on MSNBC, which airs at 11 p.m. on weeknights. And I want to play a little clip of that and talk about it at the on the other side. So go, let's go ahead and do that. Well, actually, I, I look at it in a, a very different way. I see it as Congress not spending money that they don't have, um, because every day that I've been in Congress, we've done exactly that. So the taxpayers are actually winning here uh, because Congress hasn't organized. Look, my conservative colleagues on, and no, I excuse are simply me, I, I'm asking interrupt for you. commitment I'm interrupt you. on what the American people want to see. Sure. And with every passing day, it's not that Congress isn't spending money. Anything that was put in place during, during Nancy Pelosi's term, none of that is going to stop. And until you put a speaker in place, nothing that you want to do is getting done. That is a, an incredible example of real time fact checking. And that is so important for us as a news organization um, to be able to arm our hosts with that kind of information to be able to stop when someone is saying something that is not right, that is not true, that is not um, inaccurate. Um, Nina, talk a little bit about what standards would say um, in this kind of scenario. I think this interview was done so well. She really pushed back, Stephanie really pushed back to when Lauren um, Boebert was mentioning things that were very inaccurate. And um, if anybody watches the longer version of that video, there is an explainer at the top that Stephanie says about why we're bringing her in, about why we're having her voice on. And it's clear we're not dumbing down to our audience. We're explaining to them what we're doing, what the reasoning for giving her space and voice in our platforms is. Once we are transparent, once we um, call hosts to, uh, you know, hosts can fact check in real time, we are doing a service to our audience. That is so important um, and so um, such a great example. Um, Marcy, talk a little bit about how we how we reach out to folks um, as booking producers to convince them to come on with our hosts um, across the board. You've been doing this for a while. Um, you've had to call victims of horrible cases. You've had to call folks who won the lottery. Um, tell us a little bit about how that works um, as as a booking producer and the challenges. Yeah, so it's um, it's about getting on the phone with them and telling them you have a unique story. And not everybody wants to be on television. Not everybody, I work at MSNBC, so not everybody wants to be on MSNBC. And you have to know your facts. You have to know why they are important to the story. And you have to tell them that and, and really, um, really convince them that they have something to add that a national audience, or if you're talking about local news, uh, a local audience would benefit from. And, you know, it takes relationship building sometimes. Um, sometimes you are chasing the same guest for months, calling them every week, calling them every, every day, even depending on the story and just saying, are you ready yet? Are you feeling uncomfortable about something? Let's let's talk this out. And um, sometimes it pays off, sometimes it doesn't. And you just you know live to fight another day if it doesn't. Lorianne, um, I want to bring you back into the conversation. You um, deal with a lot of folks with different backgrounds, people who are really rich that want to be on TV. Mm -hmm. How, in some cases, how do you decide who's credible enough to be on the air in your shows with folks um, that that are watching at home that are. They're very, you have a very smart audience. How do you determine um, who makes the cut? Well, when it when it comes to that, we, money with when, with with money comes agenda, and so if you have a short seller on, which is a hedge fund guy or whomever, you have to know what their holdings are. And so a lot of times, you know, you know, you could have somebody on like Bill Ackman. He was, you know, his hands were ringing. He was flipping out. We found out later he was shorting something. Those are things where the real-time background check is so important to push on. 
it's it's I get personally on the phone with these individuals and I do push back. Um, and then also I ask about disclosure. There should always be disclosure when you have folks on anything that's related to money because you want to know the why. Why are they in a certain position? Um, when it comes to analysts, the same thing. Do they make a market in a stock? Well, if they make a market in the stock and they're either touting it up or touting it down, that's the why. And so the more disclosure you can give somebody, the better. But they do know that you know, you're not going to come on for promotional purposes. And we also have standards. You know, If your company is 500 million or less, you're not coming on because what happens is if you're the market cap of a company, the smaller it is, the easier the stock is to pop up if you have people that start buying. And so there's more volatility. So you do have these instances where people who I like to call grifters, try to come on and you know utilize the platform for their own needs. And so that's why it's so imperative for journalists to get on the phone to see if not only if they can walk and talk, but if there's an agenda on their end and then flag it and then you know go to your EP and just say, hey, listen, this person might not work. And, that is and such a, Jesse, such a I'd just point. like to piggyback off of what Lorian's saying. Um, you know, for us as uh, journalists, when we are covering a fast moving story, a breaking story, for example, a shooting somewhere, we want to put on those voices that have seen something, that have an idea of what has happened. And, you know, how are we finding them? We're looking for pictures uh, on Twitter. People are there, they're posting pictures, they're saying, I saw this. But you can't just go ahead and put them on the air because we have to make sure that we are credibly telling the story. Mm -hmm. And you know, you may have a bad actor or you may have someone that's just seeking attention that just wants to be on TV. So it's imperative in a fast moving story that you don't try to be first with it. You try to be accurate, you try to be right. So when that happens, you get on the phone with them. What did you see? How did this happen? Can you tell me anything else that would let me know that you are actually there and that you have a point of view that matters to a national audience? You know, if I can just add one quick thing. Yeah, go ahead. When it comes to Twitter particularly, and I'm sure, um, you know, Marcy, you can agree, we had, uh, we had it was one of the shootings with, um, um, within one of the corporations. There was a photo that was circulating somebody lifted that photo off another account. And so even with the photos that people are tweeting or posting, they might not even be their own. And so there's so much when it comes to the standards of vetting to make sure that that person is indeed saying they are there or whatever. I don't want to get into too much of a discussion over disinformation because that is a whole nother hour <laughs> um, that we can spend um, on that. But a, a question from Martha, which is interesting. Um, she's got two questions. I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the first one is uh, when a source is flagged, does that designation remain constant or can they truth their way out of news detention um, as the way Martha puts it? Um, I think everyone, um, you know, every situation is different. Um, people do make mistakes. We are all human. Um, if a mistake is in, uh, in inadvertent, we you know understand that. If something is a, on purpose, that's a whole nother um, story and it just raises the level of concern for us as producers of why we should put that person on the air again. Um, and then the other question for Martha, and I want to toss this one over to Bill, is what is the most effective way for viewers to provide feedback when they have concerns about the gaps in representation? Um, and I don't want to use the answer, uh, tweet it. Um, but Bill, give us give us your take on how folks can reach out. Well, um, I think um, obviously social media is a huge platform um, that we take a look at. Um, I'm not I, I don't know the breadth of all of the resources that NBC has as far as viewers contacting them, but I'm sure, you know, um, that we look at all of those, um, you know, emails and messages. Um, and I think yeah, whatever platform you interact with your viewers on, I think that's really the best way you, that's where you hear, you know, what people want to see, um, what's, what's lacking. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, you know, the shows are responsive and, and, um, you know, make changes accordingly. 
I want to talk a little bit about um, both sides in um, things, and that's been a topic that's been discussed a bit. Um, there, there's been, you know, the, the question about what people see versus what's reality, what's not. Um, someone can say the sky is light blue, someone can say the sky is dark blue, but when someone tells me the sky is green, that's not true. Um, and that's not both sides. You can't give that person a platform to say, um, to say, oh, sure. Um, I wanna toss this one over to, to Nina. Um, what's the difference between fair representation and then both sides in something. Sure, fair representation and both sides are totally different concepts. Giving equal weight to everything, to two sides of a story, a pro and an anti, may not actually get you any closer to the truth. So one thing I've seen, um, and I saw this Pew study from last summer that really said that the audience expects journalists to give all sides of a story. They want to hear from every voice. But we can't, we're not here to say, here's a scientist talking about the solar system and here's a flat earther. We're not here to give you the gamut of every experience from every person. We are here to give you information so that you can make a decision. So it's not about both sides and it's not about pro anti. It's really about giving weight to voices that need to be heard, that have something to say. Andre, um, I guess our audience does want to talk a little bit about disinformation, talk a little bit about the barriers that we have set up at NBC News, the kind of the standards and, and the, the mechanisms that are in place at NBC News as a whole for us to avoid the situation of us, of us airing anything that could be potentially be seen as disinformation, misinformation, or just a flat out lie. Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll start at the very top of that. Um, you know, legal and standards for me from an executive producer standpoint is, is absolutely critical. Uh, I, I'm of the mindset that if we have a question, like that resource is set up for that very reason. Um, it's staffed around the clock for that very reason. If there is something that we doubt, if there is something that we see in an email that's like, well, you know, is that really true? Do we really have all of the sides of it? Um, I urge my producers, we got to utilize the legal and standards department um, because it's that's what they're there for. We, we can't not have them. Um, and then, you know, getting down to the lower tier level of whether it's a PA, whether it's a segment producer, whether it's um, even an anchor who may see something somewhere, it, it, you know, it's always double sourcing. And then even after double sourcing, going to your EP for someone to someone like me and saying, hey, this is what I have. I have this source and this source. So what do we, how do we want to approach this? Again, nine times out of 10, even after it's double source, if I still have a question, I'm still going to go to standards about it because it just, at the end of the day, what, what can it hurt? It's what, three minutes to send an email. So I, I think it's, you know, we have all of those processes in place at NBC, but it's really the, the double sourcing. We don't ever, it's kind of our bedrock principle and, and everybody on this call knows this, single sourcing just doesn't cut it. Like that, it, it doesn't stop there. You got to get it double source. And even after that, you, you kind of go to your EP or I would go to my boss and just say, hey, you know what, Janelle Rodriguez, this is this is what I got. How do we approach this? Um, again, I highly doubt she would just be like, let me get on the phone with Sanders real quick. We were just in that situation yesterday when it came to the possibility of a press conference surrounding um, a story that we were covering and we thought video was going to be shown during that press conference. And the first thing we we decided to do was like, hey, you know what, let me get on the phone with Sanders. I, I called my boss, my boss called Sanders, we worked out a plan around it. Um, so I, I, all of those kind of resources and protocols are put in place to make sure disinformation does not happen. And then I, you know, I'll end by saying, it's it's so not important to be first. It's much more important to be right. I think that's you know that's something that I I pride myself on as an EP, and and I see a lot at NBC. It's we're not rushing to get up for a special report just because we see ABC up. We're not rushing to get on the air just because we see you know somebody else tweeted it out. Uh, it's more, your reputation will be damaged more as a news organization if you are rushed and you are wrong and you have to retract rather than if you're two minutes late. I, I, very few people are, are, are counting, well, CNN sent it first and then ABC sent it, then NBC, very few people are doing that. But if you're flat out wrong, that's what people are going to remember. 
And there's some great resources at NBCU Academy as well about, um, about that. And I know that Katie's been um, posting some of those in the chat, so be sure to check those. Um, I want to uh, turn to Nina and this question here about um, gotcha questions and how we are accused sometimes um, by some viewers that um, journalists pose gotcha questions um, in, in a sense when all we're trying to do is find out the re reasons, the, the, the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, tell us a little bit about the difference between a gotcha journalism and, as, as some call it, and, um, and just the facts of you know, reporting the facts. Yeah, I think uh, gotcha journalism sort of comes with an agenda. There is a point to go to. There's a there's an idea already in mind that the journalist wants to fulfill. NBC doesn't do that. We have a set of questions that we don't provide to the to the interviewer that ask about their stance, that kind of clarify what they wanted to say. Um, why did they do something? Why did they vote this way? How? What have they experienced? What past experiences come into line? Those are all to give the audience information. It is not to set an agenda. It is not to get people um, in the put people in a corner. It is not to make people feel um, like we are hammering them or battering them or this is some sort of SVU courtroom battle. Um, but it's the idea is to really make sure that we ask the questions that elicit the right answers that people want to know, need to know, and are current and will give them time to make decisions. Um, Bill, I want to turn to you uh, and, and kind of turn this question over to you and, and, and see what you think. Um, a lot of folks uh, think that, that by coming on TV, they, you know, they're getting exposure, they're getting, how do you find the people that really do mean, they want, they want, they mean well when they come on versus someone who just wants to be on TV? Um, are, are, we, are we talking more like panelists, experts, talking heads, or panelists, experts, talking heads, and sometimes even folks who are involved and in say, you know, witnesses who say they saw something and and may not have the best um, intention when they come on. Yeah, um, you know, uh, as far as like witnesses and people, you know, we were talking before. Sometimes it's just your, you know, it's you're doing your due diligence and you're you're, um, you know, making sure there's no red flags. Um, talking to them beforehand, um, but it's live TV. And, um, you know, every once in a while, someone has an agenda. We were covering a very tragic incident and the interview was going great and it wasn't an eyewitness. And um, at, the end of the video, at the end of the interview, he said, let's go, Brandon. You know, so you sometimes you just can't control what what people do. Um, again, it's like you're doing your due diligence and you can only control so much. Um, I find that, you know, the majority of people that we have on, you know, our talking heads, our experts, we, um, you know, especially the regulars, we have a, you know, we develop relationships with them. That's the reason that they keep coming back. Um, I think, you know, the majority of the guests that we have on are passionate. They're obviously experts in their fields and at the top of their game. So that's why we have them. And um, yeah, I think that we're, I think the booking department as a whole has a pretty good appreciation for like, you know, we're, we're, we're putting the right people on TV. Excellent point. Um, I want to open this one up to Marcy um, as well. Marcy, the responsibility of fair representation, um, how do you quantify that? How do you, at the end of the day, look back at your lineup of guests and say, that was a fair representation of guests today on our show? Um, how do you quantify that? Yeah, it's something that we are actually looking at every single day. It is top of mind for us going into the show, after the show. And we, we have a post-show meeting. Here's what we did well. Here's what we didn't do well. And you can actually just see it when you look up at the television. You know, I'll go back to those two graphics you showed. You look up at the television and it's easy to count one, two, three white men. Um, and so, you know, we have um, a database of everybody we use and there's a nice little red number there showing us uh, you know, the diversity the numbers that we have, and we look at that every single day. Let's peel back the curtain a little bit on that and what how we use guests, we, we call guest tracker, which is our internal system, our internal Rolodex that we all use at NBC um, News and at CNBC and at, and at NBC News Now and MSNBC, of course. 
that um, that's an internal Rolodex that we use to highlight folks that we have on our shows so that everyone's aware of what guests are booked on what hours. Um, they happen to have a, a, a marker that shows that this person is perhaps male, female, how they identify, um, and their gen their race um, and ethnicity is also noted there. Um, obviously, people are people, they're not numbers, but we do um, have a percentage of here is the number of diverse guests we had on today versus the number that we didn't have um, you know, on other on one show or the other. The other reason we use Guest Tracker, which is also good, is if you search for doctor, a list of doctors will pop up. Um, and you know, I've over the years put in doctors with diverse backgrounds into Guest Tracker so that they're there when people search for doctors, lawyers, you know, just you know, just the race, the gender, um, and their ethnicity, um, notwithstanding. Uh, if someone's a good guest, you're gonna you're gonna put them on. So that's a little bit of a of a kind of behind the scenes. Um, we have a question from Larry Moore, who asks about the process for finding a a broader panoply of news stories to cover. This one's for Andre. Do you have people scanning the internet constantly, in addition to things like the Associated Press wires? And how do you keep your finger on the pulse of national and world news? And I'll I'll add something to that after after that. But Andre. Uh, I think the best way is, is not what you might think. Um, yes, uh, I as an EP, I, I watch everything, I read everything, I encourage my senior team to do it as well. Um, I have my producers constant scanning the wires, things like that. But you know, in my experience, the best way to find the most broad range of stories is simply in your team. If you have a very, very diverse and broad team, broad your team kind of runs the gamut of different people of different races and ethnicities and beliefs, you're going to, by nature, you're going to get all of those stories that you might have missed. Um, you're, you know, I urge my team every single day, come with a pitch. Um, and, and it's not, you know, mandatory. You don't get a slap on the hand if you don't have one one day. It's, I'm not tallying in a corner, oh, so-and-so pitched how many these days. Um, because I want people to come, if they don't have one one day, then they don't. But if they do, then they do. Um, and every single day, Everybody on my team drops something into our Slack channel as a pitch. It can be a story that's just the VO. Um, it could be a story that turns into a reporter. It could be a story that turns into a guest. It could be a story that we don't even know how it's going to develop, but we're just going to say, hey, you know what? Let's reach out to booking later on, and we, we might be able to put that together or something. Or, you know what? Let's, let's put this in our back pocket. We might be able to use it. For me, that's the best way to get those broad range of stories because at the especially at a network again and i'll go back to how news is consumed nowadays everyone is going to be reporting on the same big stories from the ap everyone's going to be reading the wall street journal everyone's looking at the new york times we're all looking at the washington post we're at, at some point you're going to get the same story over and over and over so how do you differentiate yourself and how do you find those broad stories Use the resources that are at your fingertips and, and encourage everybody on the team. What did you see today? Um, what are your friends talking about at the dinner table? Hey, you just you just went out of the country and you, you had problems getting back in because of I'm making this up, you know, some kind of COVID protocol or something. Tell me about that. That might be a story. We don't know. But for me, that's the best way to get those broad range of stories. We benefit too here at NBC News and at, at an MSNBC from having the wide expanse of the NBC News journalistic news gathering operation. We have bureaus around the country, around the world. We have reporters in all corners of the world. We have reporters and producers and, and, and folks on staff that speak a variety of different languages. I just got off the phone yesterday with a producer who speaks Portuguese and was able to track down some video of George Santos in Brazil because of her diverse background and her understanding of the language. Um, we have a booking producer who speaks Spanish and is, was able to track down family members of those who lost loved ones at the Uvalde massacre. So those are examples of the breadth and the, the, the expanse of NBC News. Um, Lorianne, talk a little bit about um, CNBC's expanse around the world as well and how you identify guests um, and, and deal with world leaders, for example, from around the world. And we, we're down to our final few minutes here. 
Yeah, sure. So, I mean, just like with MSNBC, you know, we've got CNBC Europe, CNBC Asia, CNBC Africa. And so, you know, we're constantly working with each other to see what are we all working on? How can we expand upon it? And more importantly, like our colleagues across the pond, they're going to be more of an expert, if you will, of whatever particular business story there is. So we're really fortunate, just like you guys are, in terms of leveraging with our colleagues, right? Because they are a great representation of whatever's going on because they live there. And so by able by us being able to speak with folks that live in other parts of the world, they can also give us another um, lens, if you will, looking at the story and how we tell it so we can you know, do a better job on our end. I, I wanted to uh, have you tell us a little bit about the process for getting ready for an interview. Um, if you're going to be a guest, um, talk about, and, and feel free to share an example, but talk about how guests should prepare. I mean, we don't give them the questions, um, yeah. but the guests know what they want to say and, and how do you prepare for one? Sure. So anybody that is a, a booker or a producer, you always pre-interview the guest because that way you can give the notes and background material to the anchor. So that way they can challenge the guest, right? Or anticipate what they're going to be saying. And so um, I had a CEO on, he was a brand new CEO of Cadbury. And I, I tried for three days to get this guy on the phone for a pre-interview because he's never done TV. And the press person I knew very well. And I said, listen, I'm really nervous. He's going to go on Squawk Box. Joe Kernan is going to rip him one if he doesn't answer correctly. During that time, sugar was at an all-time high. It was like one of the biggest stories for any type of candy maker. Well, fast forward, the, the CEO literally had like a brain fart on air, could not remember anything. The only thing he remembered was that they were rolling out their new sugarless gum. And every question that the anchors asked, he gave the same answer because like, you saw flop sweats. It was unbelievable. Finally, at the end, Joe starts making fun of him because Joe says, oh, wait, let me get it. You've got the new gun coming out. And so after it was over, you know, the CEO said, oh, I'm so sorry. And meanwhile, I'm flame texting the press person saying, I'm never having this man on air. You stink. You're terrible. I mean, it was like a drama within a drama. And um, P.S. The guy is no longer CEO, but then he also told him, "You, this is why you needed the pre-interview." And then I found out after a couple of rounds with my fellow PR buddies, they took that clipping and showed it to their CEO, saying, "This is why you do a pre-interview, and this is why you are media trained." Which means that they go through the process of being interviewed in a mock, like in a mock interview, so to speak, with their press people. Uh, incredible, uh, incredible story. Um, we have something from the chat that I want to highlight, and it is, um, if a viewer sees something that they perceive as biased or not fair, what's the best way to communicate that to the network? And Nina, um, tell us a little bit about the options we've got, and, and we'll wrap after that. Sure. Um, social is a good way to get attention, like Bill said, that will um, not only get you there, but also there can other people can weigh in too, and we will take a look at that. Um, emailing, we have general email, calling, all of that is fine. Um, we really do take a strong look at what, what is fair and what is biased. And that's what the standards department is for. We have 13 people. They all come from very diverse backgrounds. They all have very diverse TV, social, you know, um, um, news websites, backgrounds. We're looking constantly. So if you see something, I would glad I would be so happy to hear from you guys, from anybody because we are looking so constantly. It's a twenty four seven operation. So if something slips past us, then um, I, I'd be I'd love to. Get, we would love to know. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for that. And I want to say thank you to all of our panelists and everybody who's joining. Um, what a great conversation! And thanks, of course, to those of you in the audience. If you or your students are curious about how journalists do what they do, feel free to check out some of our free content. As I mentioned, on NBCUAcademy.com, NBCU Academy is celebrating its second anniversary, and there are all kinds of video lessons and articles to help anyone trying to land a job in journalism here at NBC News or at MSNBC or in media or tech. Plus, we want to give you um, an invitation there now to register um, for the NBCU Academy's Next Level Summit. We are all storytellers is what it's going to be called, and it's on March 22nd. So go to NBCUAcademy.com to learn all about it and to sign up. All right. Well, now let's toss it back to John Silva with the News Literacy Group. 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, just listening to all of your experience and expertise. We really appreciate your time uh, working with us today and talking to educators. Um, so we have another session, one more session with the folks from um, NBC Universal. That's coming up in just about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, there's another, there's a separate Zoom link. You can go, you can go there. Uh, the next session is called, how can the news media repair its trust problems with marginalized communities? Um, and uh, that's going to be starting about 10 minutes. I just want to, I want to mention one thing. Um, it's impossible to get to every single question that people have um, in these sessions. And we try to get to as many as we, as we can. I know there are several in the Q&A that we just didn't have an opportunity to get to. So we are actually going to download all those questions. Um, we'll send the ones to the uh, uh, NBCU folks uh, to get some answers. And we'll, we'll follow up on those next week in the follow-up email to make sure that we there's some really important questions. We try to get those. So um, thank you everyone for this session. Um, our Slack messages on, on, the, on our side have been really fun making notice of things. So uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, so we'll stay on here for just another quick minute in case there's additional questions, but otherwise uh, we have a 10 minute break. Um, there's a separate link for the next session. You can find that at the agenda page and we will drop that um, in the chat here in just one second okay let me see sorry uh i'll drop a link to uh the agenda page for everybody so you can go back to that uh so thank you very much uh we're going to stop the recording um hope you all have enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully you, those of you attending can join us in the next session <laughs>